You're listening to the Rise to Thrive podcast with your hosts, Linda Tate and Amelia Travis. Rise to Thrive is your life resource for manifestation, wellness, and abundance. Tune in weekly so you can thrive daily. This week's episode, coming at you. Change Finance is not your normal Wall Street company. They are woman-owned and offer investments that change the world. Go to change-finance.net slash RTT to learn more and start investing today. Change Finance is a registered investment advisor, and this is not an offer to buy or sell anything. Welcome back to Rise to Thrive podcast with your hosts, Amelia Travis and Linda Tate. We are pumped to talk to you guys today about a topic that is really powerful making decisions. Making decisions is something that we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to do, especially when we perceive something as a big decision. So today we want to share with you two simple truths. One, there are no big decisions. Spoiler alert. (laughs) And Linda, what is the second? Nothing compares to the power of a clear decision. Am I right? Never underestimate the power of a decision. Okay. I was trying to paraphrase her, you guys. (laughs) Never underestimate the power of a decision and there are no big decisions. And you guys are probably sitting there like, what in the who nanny are you talking about? I'm really scratching my (laughs) nogger. So let's unpack this a little bit. Uh, Linda, I want to share first as per google.com, a decision is a conclusion or resolution reached after consideration in case you forgot what a decision is. It is a conclusion, a conclusion or resolution, conclusion or resolution reached after After consideration. Okay, cool. So yeah, you guys probably know what decisions are by now. Hopefully you've made one or two in your life. If you haven't, OMG. No, just kidding. You at least made the decision to listen to this podcast. So here we are. And let's- have, this is interesting, Amelia, because you know, if you really think about it, every single second's a decision. It totally is. Like I wake and- up, now I'm deciding, am I going to get out of bed or not? Now I'm deciding if I'm going to brush my teeth or not. Now I'm deciding if I'm going to meditate or not. Now I'm deciding if I'm going to have water with lemon and salt or not. You You know what's the statistic according to psychology today is that the average person makes, and I quote, an eye popping 35,000 choices a day. First of all, eye popping, like, what does that mean? I don't want my eyes to pop. Like, I think that's like, they're trying to be clever, like jaw dropping, eye opening, but they're like eye popping. Like that sounds like your eyeballs are popping in your head. I used to want to pop hamsters eyeballs by squeezing them. Oh my God, Linda. (laughs) I just did it it once. I just thought it like, I don't know. You popped a hamster's eyeball by squeezing it? No, I thought- (laughs) Start this episode over. (laughs) You guys, we'll stay with us. What happened? Okay, when I was younger, I used to think that if you squeezed hamsters just a little bit, that they're like, I, I wanted to see their eyes bulge and I wondered if you could pop them. But you know what really happens is that they <laughs> go poop. Yeah, what would happen if a giant picked you up and squeezed you? Would your eyeballs pop or would you poop? You'd probably poop because you'd be like, holy shit, this giant is about to kill me. They're about to squeeze and break all the bones. <laughs> That's like d- decision making 101. <sighs> all right. So, so, so you guys, this is 2000 decisions per hour or approximately one decision every two seconds. So if you feel like you are not good at making decisions, first of all, that's a bunch of bullshit because you've been making decisions up the yin yang for your whole every, life, every second, all the time. And, and in a lifetime, well, I don't know about this number. I think it's going to be more than this, but <clears throat> this says uh, that the average person will make 773,618 decisions in a lifetime and that you'll come to regret 143,262 of them. This is where I think they took statistics a little too far. <laughs> Somebody was just like, you know what would be fun? Let's just make some shit up and post it on the internet. I think that's actually a lot of people, and that's like half the internet. 
Um, right. 86,400 seconds are in a day. And I'm of the belief system that you're making 86,400 decisions in a day. Well, but you're sleeping though, like eight of those hours. You're making the decision to stay asleep. Okay, I'll redo the math and get back to you next time. All right. Well, we're having a blast talking about these numbers, but let's get into the meat of it. So, so what if I told you that there are no big decisions and you'd be like, Amelia, you are wrong because it was a big decision to get married. It was a big decision to um, quit my job. It was a big decision to, you know, buy a house, right? These are big decisions. And I say, no, they are not big decisions. They are a series of small, clear decisions that you continue to make day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. The decision to buy a house, you know, there's the point at which you decide to sign the promissory note. There's that that might be the point that feels like a really big decision, but you continue to make the decision to live in the house, to pay the mortgage, to pay the homeowner's insurance. Those are continual decisions that you keep making where if you chose to do something differently sooner or later, you would not live in the house anymore. <laughs> and you decided to buy the house long before you signed that promissory note. Had you decided to buy a house? Yeah. Had you come into that resolution and then part of the decision making process was, you know, to keep making the decision to buy a house, which caused you to keep looking at houses and keep considering different things. And you made a gajillion different decisions in that about what you wanted or needed in the house and what you didn't want or need. So where are we going with this? Well, I think that a lot of us spend a significant amount of time in pain and suffering and frustration because we're in the place of perceived indecision, which by the way, staying in that place of perceived indecision about whatever the particular topic is, is also a decision. (laughs) Heads up. Decision purgatory. Yeah. So you're in decision purgatory and you'll probably recognize this in yourself if you feel like you're often procrastinating. So procrastinating is basically a symptom of, of uh, choosing to live in decision purgatory. And it can really be a big drain on your life. It can dra- you know, really um, drain your mental and emotional resources. It can cause anxiety. It causes you to stay on that hamster wheel of living in the future. What if I do this? What if I do that? And then following, you know, all the little rabbit holes that those go to and all the different ways that this could go. Speculation. Yeah. And we've, we've talked to you guys a lot about, you know, intuition and um, how do you know what your yes and no is? And how do you, how do you trust yourself? Um, But today I really want to shed some light on what decisions are and how we make them and how we can start to leverage the power of effective decision making to experience more freedom in our lives. So Linda, when you say never underestimate the power of a decision, what does that mean to you? For me, that means that in any instant out of all of those 86,400 seconds of whatever number of those you are actually awake, um, the decision you make in any of those moments could change your life. And literally any decision could change your life. So when I say never underestimate the power of a decision, it's when you move from indecision to decision that you're stepping into something different Mm -hmm. or perhaps the same, but like there's so much power and weight to each of those. So for me, that's really motivating because it gives me freedom to know, and it's that quick. It's one second. It's one decision to change my life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when we don't do that, you guys ever heard the term analysis paralysis? Like you're just, you're stuck in thinking about all of the different ways that things can go. So here's what I know is true. I believe that what we perceive as the size of a decision, it really doesn't have anything to do with the the decision's size. I don't believe that decisions have size. I believe that all decisions are are essentially the same the same size. One size fits all. One size fits all decisions. But what we perceive as the size of a decision is based on how that decision will impact our identity. 
So I think this is one of the primary things is once you make this decision to buy the home, to eat the burrito instead of the salad, there it is again, to uh, go on the third date with that person, to sleep with them, to say uh, yes, to say yes, to say no, to buy the car, whatever the thing is. It's about the impact on your identity. Who is it going to require you to be that you made this decision? And what parts of you will you have to let go of because you made this decision? So I think this is like especially potent for us with relationships, whether we're agreeing to become more committed in a relationship like Linda, you know, you just got engaged when you had to make the decision of saying yes or saying no to Brendan when he asked you to marry him, that decision was informed by your future identity, right? Do I want to be Linda Andrews? That's his last name, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do I want to be Linda Andrews? Do I want to be a married woman? And then what do you perceive that identity to mean? It's um, funny because exactly those questions, even six months prior, it was like the idea of being married, I had really had like a hard time digesting. And I realized that like the indecision around that was really all coming from me because of having some issue with the perceived identity change of that decision. And when I had cleared that up, you know, everything shifted. And, you know, the yes to saying, yes, I will marry you came long before that actual ask, right? It's like when you're signing the promissory note, the decision to buy the house wasn't in that signing of the paper. The decision to be married wasn't necessarily in that yes. It was quite a while prior to that. Uh, but I had- And even, even that was probably not a singular thing, but it was a compound of you know, millions of little decisions. It, it, it's like, you know, taking inventory of all of the uh, communications you guys have had and all of the conflicts you guys have had and how you guys work living together. It's like you're synthesizing the information and making, I believe in relationships, we're constantly making decisions about what we want and what we don't want, what we're willing to tolerate, what we're not willing to tolerate. And so, you know, that one singular yes was really it was a million other little yeses that you had said to stay with him, to choose to remain in communication, to choose to overcome conflict, to choose to stay in monogamy um, over and over and over and over and over. And so then when that one, you know, what we perceive as the big decision is really not a big decision at all. It's a series of small, clear decisions. Right. It's sort of like, yeah, obviously that was the yes. Like I'm making that same yes every single day. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And then it's a, it's on like a continuum, right? Because you could say yes to the engagement and then like, and I'm not saying you're going to do this, but then like that could, it could shift and change and become a no, right? So, so I, th this is another factor of decision-making is like one of the thing that affects things that affects how we perceive the size of a decision is its longevity or its permanence, right? So um, we perceive marriage as a big decision because we perceive it to be something that has permanence or at the very least longevity that's going to then impact our identity for the foreseeable future. Like same thing with having a child. Having a child is perceived as a very big decision because it's a very permanent decision, right? Once, once those little suckers come earthside, like they're, they're there. You got them for life. Um, and obviously there are decisions that can be made. You can choose to let your child be adopted. You can choose to be a neglectful parent and not be present. You can choose to be an absent parent and not be in your child's life. But, you know, we perceive having a child as a big decision because um, creating a human is a pretty permanent thing to do, <laughs> right? And, uh, and then I'll give my caveat, like the only, the only big decision, true big decision, I believe, is death. Choosing to take your own life or the life of someone else. That's something that I say we can call that a big decision because it's a permanent decision. So it doesn't allow for the evolution or the shifting or changing of the decision. 
So could the only, could only big decisions be permanent? I think so. I, you know, I stay away from like words like only, it's just an interesting thought. I think that I feel pretty comfortable saying that there's no such thing as a big decision. There is such a thing as a permanent decision. And, and I, I believe that, that that death is pretty much the only one. Like death and life. I mean, you know, but the, the thing is, and like, I'm not saying, <laughs> not saying anyone should do this, but like we can create life and we can take life away, right? So like, um, there's no undoing, of, but there's, those. well, there's undoing creating life by taking it away, right? So, right. but there's no undoing death to our knowledge, right? You can, you, you could have another baby, but like, yeah, we're going down the rabbit hole okay, here. But so, I wanted to say decisions equal information, mm-hmm. information that's part of the grand experiment. Yes. You want to unpack that a little bit for us? Yeah. Because in every decision, like, let's say that you're, you finally, you move from indecision to decision and now you think, fuck, I made the wrong decision. You know, I don't believe there's a wrong decision ever. Neither do I. Decisions that give you information. There's decisions that give you uh, contrast. There's decisions that help you pivot. Uh, and maybe, you know, I have someone close in my life that decided to move in with their partner and they decided to end their relationship that same day. Well, that was probably awkward. Yeah. And, and like <laughs> decisions that, you know, the decision to move in with each other that gave that much contrast in that short of time to show like, oh, this is a no, you know, could have been the biggest gift of all to then end the relationship and then them both move on. Um, so the, the information available, especially when you you have that big talk up of like, this is a big decision. Maybe what's really the big part is the information that's available through that decision rather than the decision itself actually being so big. Yeah. So I think some of the things that when we say this is a big decision, what we really mean is um, this is going to have continuous significant impact on my uh, comfort zone. It's going to require me to experience life differently than I'm currently experiencing it. Or, you know, like I said, with identity, this is going to require me to step into a new way of moving and being in the world, something that's not familiar to me yet. Uh, You know, I don't know what it, I think parenting is a really great example here. Like when we, um, I think part of the reason that it feels like such a big decision to have a child is one, the permanence or the longevity that we already talked about, but two is the identity. It's then shifting you from you know, a person who has autonomy and agency and, and, and the freedom really to be and do whatever they want to someone who has to continuously consider this other being in all subsequent decisions. So, and, and it being extremely or 100% up until that point, unfamiliar, right? Exactly. Like you can't know what parenting is like just from watching other parents, right? You could have some semblance of the idea, but you won't fully know until you are a parent. Exactly. And then it also has um, an impact on finances. So how things will impact our financial situation is another big contributing factor to how we perceive the size of a decision. If it's going to stretch your finances thin, if it's going to make you considerably more money, like if something, you know, if, um, if uh, you were given the decision to, um, do something that was completely against your morals and for doing it, you would receive, you know, a million dollars. That would feel like a big decision because it would cause significant change in your identity. It would require you to step outside your comfort zone. It would have a massive impact on your finances. So it's this reverberation of change that will happen in your life. That is really, I think how we measure the size of a decision. 
the reason that I, that I, you guys might be like, okay, so this is all the semantics. Like you're saying there are no big decisions, but you're saying that it's going to have, you know, significant impact in this areas of your life. Yes. The important thing that I want to like really communicate though, is that, um, decisions are, are, they happen in a series. So you don't just make it once you keep making many different decisions every moment. And those are ever shifting and changing that then weave the fabric of reality that you're actually experiencing. So, you know, as Linda says, like you can pivot at any time, you can have made one small, clear decision, and then you can be like, oh, actually this is creating an impact on my identity or on my comfort zone or on my finances or on my relationships or on some aspect of my life. That's not what I want. So I'm going to pivot and I'm going to make a different small, clear decision. And what I also really want to emphasize is that, you know, most of the, most of the big changes that we want in our lives, whether it's changing, you know, your body or the way that you nourish yourself or changing your job or changing your income or changing your um, social positioning. Like we think of a lot of these things as like a big decision, but it's not a big decision. It's about getting really clear on who you want to be and what you want to do. And then continuing to make small, clear decisions every day that lead to that point. It's like so, the aligned, aligned action, like through your decisions. Yeah. It's like you can decide that you want to lose 20 pounds and the power of that decision has energetic impact, but it doesn't have results unless you continue to make small, clear decisions every day about how you want to move your body, about how you want to eat, about um, how you want to speak to yourself uh, and about what you choose to perceive when you look in the mirror. How are you going to, you know, um, I mean, yes, there's the actual like measure in that one of like losing a specific number of pounds, but the decision itself isn't something that you just make once. It's something that you do over and over and over. And this is really the central message that I want you guys to understand because I think there's freedom in it. I think that instead of looking at that thing that's on your horizon that you want to do or that you've been putting off or, or whatever it is that you can ask yourself, is this really a big decision or is it a small, clear decision that I can make today and that I can honor and continue to make tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day until all of those small, clear decisions add up to an entirely new life. There's a quote that I love. It's in the moments of decision, your destiny is shaped. And I think the add on to that is in every moment you're making a decision that's shaping your destiny. Absolutely. So how do we get better about making decisions? How do we, I mean, you know, in, in, and if you guys haven't listened to the episode, trust yourself yet, go listen to that episode because we'll give you some actual tools for discerning at least your intuitive yes or no. But I think we can give you guys some, some strategy and some ideas too, to um, become more practiced at making those small, clear decisions. Yeah. And one of the big things here is recognizing that you're in your mind, you might be building up big versus small decisions. And the reality is you're making tons of decisions every day, all the time in this moment, even to be listening still, to be listening still, to be listening still, that's a decision. And so whether it's a big decision or a small decision, any decision, know you're always making decisions, get confident in yourself as a decision maker. And we've talked about this before when your language is supporting like, I don't know, well, I don't know, like you're giving away your power in that mm -hmm. and honoring that you do know. And the, the decision, right, the, maybe the internal decision versus the external action they go hand in hand. So I could make the decision to lose 20 pounds and I could lose, I could make decisions. I could take opposite action. And so it's aligning the action with your decision to support the outcome that you are, are headed towards mm -hmm. so and an, an element of surrender. Always. Oh, always. Duh, yeah. Duh. So a couple of things that might help you, um, get out of analysis paralysis and start to feel more confident in making these small, clear decisions. Um, one is 
figure out what's your, your, um, what's your hard nose, right? So limit your options because there are infinite number of options in every moment and choosing, you know, one out of a thousand or even one out of 10 can feel really challenging. Um, you know, the psychology of decision making is that it's it's easiest and most effective when we're deciding out of two or three. Two or three, we can usually make a pretty clear decision. So can you narrow down the choices? And um, I always find three can often, two can feel like limiting. Three feels like, you know, like the escape option, like three, like come up with three great options. Yeah. So, and so when you're, when you're narrowing down, you know, from, let's just use like shopping as an example, maybe you're dress shopping and you've got an event that you're going to go to and it's like, oh man, feels like a big decision to decide what to wear. Well, there's, you're always going to have decision parameters, right? So, and you may not even be aware that this is happening, but like, first you're going to decide like, is this a ball gown or is it a cocktail dress? Like that's one decision. And then you're going to decide like, is it like, you know, formal or semi-formal or casual? Uh, do I want to show skin or not show skin? Do I want a neutral or a pop of color? Like these are all decisions. <laughs> the online shopping filters right now. Exactly. So you can kind of create online shopping filters, but in your own, um, in your own mind and in your own experience. And you can start to winnow down like what you actually want so that then you have some clarity. And if you decide like, well, I'm looking for a blue dress that's like mid length, that flatters my features, that doesn't show too much skin, that's appropriate for a cocktail party that costs less than a hundred dollars. Cool. Then you can probably narrow that down to like three. Um, not if you're online shopping, it'll still be like 800. <laughs> um, but once you're left with three, then make your choices. So the message here is limit your options. Um, another hot tip for decision-making is like check in with your with your body first. Halt. Are you hungry, angry, lonely, or tired? Because probably not the greatest time to make a decision other than sleep, eat, <laughs> or like go move your body and get your anger out, right? Um, try to make your decisions and your choices from a place of uh, intentional calm and self-trust rather than a place of reactiveness um, or panic, right? I think sometimes, especially if you've got that analysis paralysis procrastination thing, you guys tell me if you're with me on this one. Are you ever at a restaurant and you have the menu and you're looking at the menu and you're like, okay, I could have this or this or this. And maybe there's like three to four things that you want, but you, you, you haven't made the decision yet. And then the a server comes to the table and they're like, are you guys ready? And maybe your partner's like, yeah, we're ready. And then you're like, oh shit, I'm not ready. And then you just like, your eyes land on something. You're like, I'll have the waffles. Like, I don't even <laughs> like waffles. Right. But like, so, um, so this is making decisions under pressure, under panic. And like, there are strategies that you can learn so that you can be more effective at making decisions under pressure, I would say, you know, the first would be to say, actually, we're not ready. <laughs> Come back in two minutes. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to end up with the waffles that you didn't want. Um, I also so don't make decisions when you're hungry. <laughs> yeah, never make your hangry decisions. With decisions that are when you're making decisions, being clear of the outcome is really helpful. Like if you want to check that alignment or based on your values, but if it has to do with a certain area of your life, checking in around what's important or what is your desired experience or desired outcome, I find when you do that, the decision-making can, can become so clear through that and often writing things down, very helpful. Yes, I agree. Um, and I think part of what you're, you're saying is allow yourself to be excused from situations or people um, that are distracting or overwhelming. So if you're trying to make a clear decision, um, probably not the greatest time to like go and scroll on Instagram, right? And being stimulated with a bunch of other people's content and ideas and, and opinions. Um, 
allowing yourself to get quiet could be very helpful for uh, sorting out what is actually yours, what are actually your thoughts, opinions, and feelings, and then what are those of other people or society or the media. Um, because we have this kind of um, constant bombardment of data and of information that our brain is is continuously sifting through. And I think when you're trying to make a decision, it helps to limit that input so that you can really tune into your own internal data and information that you want to weigh in that consideration. Do you know the Ben Franklin, deci- ben Franklin decision-making chart? No, tell me all about it. This might be made up. This is from my mom. And she's like, well, you need to make a Ben Franklin chart. And it's basically, she's saying make a pro-con list. And I never had really ever done this. And I had something that I thought was, in my perception at the time, a bigger decision um, that I've, that I perceived as a bigger decision. And I was like, I'm going to do this list. Well, in that process, what I discovered was not only a pro con list, a pro con list of the yes and a pro con list of the no. Oh, that's good. It was really good. It was showing the, the contrast. And when I did this for whatever, I can't even remember what the decision was at the time. I had so much information bubble up from doing the pro con of the yes and the pro con of the no that the decision was immediately available to me that I chose to make. Yeah, that's really interesting. That's something that, you know, when I was little, my dad used to, my dad was an attorney and when we wanted something, he used to have us do a presentation and in the presentation we had to present the pros and cons of whatever it was that we wanted for ourselves but also for our parents right so the pros and cons for them of me going to this sleepover or going to the $500 cheerleading camp or whatever it is would be different than the pros and cons for me and so it's similar I hear what you're saying is like look at it um not just as singular pros and cons, but like if you go with decision A versus decision B, what are the pros and cons of each? Or if it's a yes, there's going to be pros and cons in there too, if it's a no as well. I'm going to use that. That's good. Yeah. So it becomes a quadrant and so much, so much rich information and what can start to happen. And this is something I often look for if it's feeling like either or, I always look for the creative hybrid. So if it, I I try to move it to a both and, and come up with a creative solution that's a both and, and it can be really fun and dynamic and looking at something in a way that it was never available because I was doing an either or, and the both ands, the both ands are where it's at. Huh. So there's this, um, you guys have maybe heard how like, Uh, Steve Jobs always wore the same outfit and same thing with Mark Zuckerberg. Um, I don't know if Elon Musk does it too, but very, very trendy for these extremely high level entrepreneurs to uh, limit the amount of decisions that they're making in non, non important or non impactful areas of their life so that their decision making power can be saved for, uh, for, decisions that feel more important to them. So there's this idea that decision-making power is like a depletable resource. And if you've ever noticed how at the end of the day, it's, it can be a lot more challenging to make clear decisions at the end of the day, you're just like, I, I, don't, I don't care anymore. Like just get the pizza or like do whatever, like just stop asking me questions. Cause I just like, I can't answer you right now. Um, so another suggestion that you guys could consider is like, make those pros and cons list and then sleep on it and let yourself make the decision in the morning when you're clear. I'll Um, have the pizza now. (laughs) Right. But at the end of the day, it can be more challenging because, because you've made whatever 35,000 decisions already that day. And you're like, I'm not making 35,001. (laughs) I'm just done. Um, So you go for the path of least risk. And that 24 hour rule, you know, if you can be an impulsive decision maker, having some hour 
framework to, to give yourself simmer time uh, can be very beneficial instead of the yes. And then you're like, what did I just sign up for? Mm -hmm. Have you heard of this other quadrant I'd like to share? I'd love to hear it. It's the urgent, important, not important, not urgent. So if you have this box of these four urgent, important, not urgent, not important, and sort of find out where whatever you're deciding lands, it can give you a better idea of how much of a priority you want to have it. So you have some decisions that, you know, like the handyman's coming over tonight because you have a leak in your sink that's urgent and important versus we can paint the house someday. Yeah, so I like that. I think important, that's helpful. Important but not urgent. Uh, yeah. And that helps me decide like the expeditedness made that up, how quickly I'll respond or how much to prioritize something using the, those. So, so what we want to invite you to do, dear listener, is consider in your life right now, are there any, is there anything that you have been putting off because it feels like a really big decision. Um, and maybe it's something that there's, a, there is a clear desire there. There's, there's, you know, something that you want to do or that you feel called to do and you just are putting it off because you feel like it's a big decision or you feel like you're not ready, you know, try this quadrant of, you know, urgent and important, try the pros and cons of yes and no. Um, and then check in with the permanence of the decision, the longevity of the decision, its impact on your relationships, its impact on your finances, uh, how far it's going to put you outside your comfort zone, and then how you perceive that your identity will shift in making this decision or not making this decision. And then ask yourself, is it really the decision that's big or is it, is it just big in my mind. And really I can make some small, clear decisions that I can either choose to continue making or choose to discontinue making tomorrow or the next day or the next week. Um, and, and then you can decide to begin because, you know, there's a quote from Gady that says, um, whatever you can do or dream, you can do, begin it. Boldness has genius power and magic in it. And it's one of my favorite quotes, and I think I may have shared it back in our very first episode, Start Before You're Ready, because I really believe that the secret to most of what we want is to decide and then to begin hmm. and to keep doing that every day. <laughs> decide today, begin today, and keep doing that over and over and over. And I'm telling you, it's magical. Like you will see you will see the things that you want in life manifest. You will get so much information. You know, you will, you will gain confidence uh, through that information, which whatever happens, like, and I think that's what's so important is we get so afraid that we will, like you said, Linda, make the wrong decision. And we're going to just stand on that there are no wrong decisions. And of course you nitpickers want to be like, well, what about murdering someone? And what about like, you know, like eating babies. Yeah. Okay. Don't eat any babies. <laughs> don't squeeze the hamsters. Don't squeeze the hamsters. You know, harming others is like, let's abide by like, that could be a wrong decision. Um, stealing, you know, but even in, when I look back at my own past and all of the harm that I've committed unto others and all of the lies and stealing and things that I've done were those wrong decisions. And it's like, well, they did cause harm to others. And it certainly would be interesting to see how my life would be different had I not made them. I also believe that I receive such valuable information through contrast and that I many times have chosen to learn lessons the hard way and I've learned them very well because of that. So the compassion that I can now have 
for having made what others might perceive as a wrong decision, it was formative for me and it made me the woman that I am. And so for me, I don't feel like they were the wrong decisions. Yeah, and like there's they were an, just decisions. an element too of understanding what are conscious versus unconscious decisions and inviting yourself to look at what kinds of decisions am I making that are habitual? And Amelia, when you talk sometimes about your past, I think there was also a element of survival that at each moment, like based on your space of consciousness, every decision for really anyone is the best, best available decision to them in that exact moment. So being able to look at could I be making some different and more, you know, empowering decisions for myself? Often decisions are habitual versus intentionally deciding in each moment. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. And for some reason that just always throws me back to the burrito and the salad. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I know that I will feel better if I eat the salad, but first the habitual decision is like, give me the burrito. <laughs> and it just like comes out in the last minute. Um, so hopefully this gives you guys some insight into where you are with your decision-making process, um, whether most of your decisions are unconscious and habitual or selective and intentional. Um, hopefully you've maybe had a few little epiphanies about the fact that it's really not the size of a decision, but its impact on your perceived identity and how far it's going to take you outside your comfort zone. And hopefully this encourages you to feel like uh, you are really freaking good at making decisions because you've been making like 35,000 of them every day for however many days you've been roaming this earth. So you are like super experienced decision maker. <laughs> and the ultimate, ultimate decision of being awake and being woke today. Yeah, stay woke, friends. Linda, take us to the book club. What are we reading today? This week, we would like to invite you to our book club where we are reading the book Blink by Mr. Sir Malcolm Gladwell. <laughs> I don't know if he's actually a sir. I don't think he's a knight. <laughs> Maybe he is. So I Blink, go ahead. You're gonna give I, just, I think that that name would be cool if he was Sir Malcolm Gladwell, but you're right. We should drop that in the suggestion box. I think he would appreciate that. Carry on. So Blink by Malcolm Gladwell is a book about the power of making decisions. Um, the power of thinking without thinking is the tagline. So uh, Gladwell discusses uh, how many decisions we make every day and how we think about thinking about making choices that seem to be made in the blink of an eye that actually aren't as simple as they seem. Uh, he explores why some people are brilliant decision makers while others seem to be totally inept. Uh, why some people can follow their instincts and win while others end up stumbling into error. So um, you'll want to check this book out and learn that great decision makers aren't necessarily those who process the most information or those who spend the most time deliberating, but are those who have perfected the art of filtering the very few factors that matter. From hashtag, an overwhelming hashtag filtered number of variables. <laughs> so we'll drop that into the show notes. You guys can check it out. And we'd love to hear your takeaways from today's show. What are you enjoying? What resonated with you? Leave us a comment. Connect with us on social at Rise to Thrive Podcast on Instagram at lilalife.co or at stoked underscore yogi. We love connecting with you guys. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, leave us a review, share this on your stories, send it to a friend, let somebody else be blessed um, by learning what an amazing decision maker they are. And make sure that you guys come back next week because you know we're always dropping them gems weekly so that you can thrive daily. Thrive daily. Ding.